Welcome, and thank you everyone for joining us today to learn more about the Philodemic Room and our current process to reimagine the space. As many of you may know, the, um, the Philodemic Room is a historic space in Healy Hall um, here on Georgetown's main campus. The room is home to weekly debates on Thursday night of the Philodemic Society, Georgetown's undergraduate student debating organization. And the room also hosts university community members and visitors on a daily basis for various meetings and special events. We'll go ahead and share our agenda for today's presentation. Thank you. Um, as part of our agenda today, we'll hear about prior work um, by the Philodemic Society to research and better understand their organization's history and the history of the room. We'll hear from our architectural and design partners about the architectural elements and history of the room and changes over time. And we'll provide an overview of our current project approach and engagement processes. And we should have time at the end of today's presentation to take a couple questions. So the Q&A function is enabled and during today's presentation, please feel free to submit questions and we'll get, to admit, we'll get to as many topics at the end of the presentation as possible. So to get us started with introductions, my name is Carolyn Halley. I'm a project manager in the president's office. Our office has been working closely with the Philodemic Society and other colleagues as we carefully consider this room and engage our process and um, determine how to make sure that this room is a welcoming space for all members of our university community. Hello, everyone, and welcome and thanks for joining us. My name is Lorena Bermoy. I am a senior architect and historic preservation planner in the Office of Capital Projects at Georgetown University. And uh, we've been working closely with the President's Office, the Philodemic Society, and the design team. The role of our office is to help guide and manage the design process and eventually any construction or renovations that will occur in the space. Hi, everybody. My name is Max Zhang. I'm a junior here at Georgetown currently and a member of the Philodemic Society. I sit on the Committee for Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation as convened by the Philodemic Society to participate in this kind of work, as well as keep the history of the Philodemic Society alive and the process of reconciliation an active one. Um, we're really happy to be here talking with everybody about the work that the Philodemic Society has put in over the past few years, as well as what's actively going on right now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Shepard. I'm uh, the Director of Historic Preservation at Smith Group here in Washington, D.C. And we, Smith Group, are the team that was hired to help uh, Georgetown and the Philodemic Society to reimagine this room uh, based on what came out of the report that the Philodemicians prepared. And I will hand it off to my uh, Smith Group colleagues to introduce themselves. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dayton Schroeder. I'm an architect, uh, design director with the Smith Group and the lead designer for the project. Happy to be here. Chris. Hey, everyone. My name is Chris Wood. I'm an architect with the Smith Group and I lead our cultural studio. Hi everyone, my name is Camille Hampton. I'm an architectural designer at Smith Group, um, a justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion leader with Dayton, and I am also residing in the cultural studio. And hello, my name is Susan Palmer, and I'm a principal and preservation architect with Smith Group. Hi everyone, I'm Greta Wilhelm, and a preservation architect with Smith Group. Hello all, um, my name is Lee Corda. I'm with Evergreen Architectural Arts. Um, we are a conservation and decorative arts firm that will be working with the Smith Group um, to try to translate the concepts and ideas for this room into visual artwork.
Great. So I'll be starting with talking about the work of the Philodemic Society's uh, Internal Committee on Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation. Um, so the Philodemic formed a committee to deal with this work of reconciling with the history of the society uh, about four years ago. And um, in that time has generated a lot of research on the history of the individuals represented inside of the philodemics room as well as uh, a history of the society itself um, specifically in relation to um, issues of enslavement and systems of enslavement that people who are represented in the room have participated in um, the committee is intended to keep up this work by renovating this room and making it feel inclusive as well as continuing discussions uh, internally within the organization to ensure that reconciling with our history is an active process and a dynamic one and a live one that occurs uh, from year to year, even as um, we move farther and farther away from the original genesis of this committee. Um, so a key piece of documentation the committee Put together was a report on uh, in April of 2019 that it submitted to its internal uh, business meeting, where essentially, as a result of research, it identified um, certain individuals who are represented as photographs or pieces of artwork in the room that we'll get into shortly, um, who held value, who held values or led personal histories that were. Um, fundamentally against the values that the Philodemic Society stands for now, um, thinking specifically about liberty, about justice, and about anti-racism. These were individuals who, you know, made personal choices, namely held slaves, uh, enslaved people in a way um, that conflicts very directly with those values. And it's incredibly important, um, both from a symbolic standpoint and from an active sort of uh, experiential standpoint to take down these portraits. Um, and thus we've worked with the university to replace these pictures with hopefully new images in the future um, and reimagining the room uh, so that it can continue to be um, a debate space, um, but one that is inclusive and stands to be compatible again with those values that are important to us today. Um, also part of this report is thinking about how we might continue this work in future years once the room is renovated um, by hosting different events uh, to ensure that members of the philodemic are actively aware of the longer history of the society. If we can go to the next slide. Right, okay. Uh, Jim, would you like to explain uh, the general idea with the elevations and I can talk about some of the specific portraits perhaps Sure. Um, one of the things that Smith Group did do uh, as part of beginning this process of reimagining is we did digitally scan the room to document how the room exists today. And then what we tried to do is overlay something visually onto these digital scans that helped to basically carry forward the recommendations that the Philodemic Society had made regarding the imagery in the room that they felt was problematic. So if you look at these elevations, you'll see that the uh, oval photographs that are highlighted in purple and red. The, the red indicates and corresponds to the individuals that the Philodemians identified in their report as being problematic. Right, yeah. Um, and in addition to portraits, there are also names engraved on the ceiling, or really they're in plaster uh, on the ceiling. Um, four of these individuals were directly tied to the Confederacy and as a result of that association, as well as sort of policies they indicate they advocated for um, during their time, during their lives, um, being again against these values that we hold uh, incredibly important today. Um, we've also identified them as names that we that need to be taken down so that we're not continuing to venerate individuals um, that would not adhere to values that we consider fundamental today. Uh, so just to carry forward what Max was describing, the Philodemians started the research project and issued their report. They highlighted some problematic photographs identified on the walls and 
the names on the ceiling. And I should mention just for the benefit of understanding how the room came together and the names came to the ceiling, those names were actually paired and were to represent um, famous debates throughout history. So that's how those names uh, were depicted on the ceiling. Uh, and just interestingly enough, this image on the right here happens to be another debating society at Boston College with the same uh, artisan brother Schroen who implemented the artwork. Um, the fellow Dimitians took the research to a certain point and researched uh, and made recommendations for, uh, for some of the photographs that were prob problematic in the names on the ceiling. But obviously there are other portraits in the room and uh, additional photographs where uh, there wasn't um, a decision about uh, whether the uh, photograph should stay or go based on the research that we had. So we did recommendation, re recommend to Georgetown that we, um, as part of this project, make sure we have a complete research of all of the people who are memorialized in the room so that uh, whichever direction we go, we had that documentation as sort of a baseline understanding of all of the people in the room who are identified both in the photographs that are around the wall and the portraits that hang on the wall and the names that are in the ceiling. And in addition to that, uh, it was also important for us to understand Brother Schroen, Francis Schroen, and, and his contribution to the room. So he was the decorative paint um, artisan who implemented the decorative paint schemes on the walls and the ceiling. And it's, uh, I think, uh, beneficial for the project just before we make decisions to understand if there was any documentation as to his mindset for what his intentions were as he decorated out the room. So all of that research is ongoing. We had a draft of that research that was submitted to us about two weeks ago, and the research, it's additional research that were sort of be filled out and submitted as a uh, complete report should be available by January to support our continuing uh, evaluation and design of the room. So yes, so as everyone's been explaining um, our process of evaluating what's in this room, I think it's worth noting that we began this process also with trying to understand the architectural evolution of the, of the room itself, um, its context within Healy Hall, and really understand some of the architectural changes that have happened um, through time. So what's shown on this first slide and is augmented by the three following slides that are blown up in a bit more detail is establishing a timeline. Um, so as you likely know, um, the Philodemic Room is within Healy Hall on the second floor. Um, Healy Hall itself is designated as a National Historic Landmark. Um, the landmark nomination designates the period of significance for Healy Hall as 1879 when the building was first constructed. However, a lot of the interior decoration that we see today that was executed by um, Brother Schroen wasn't really implemented until the early 20th century, so sort of in that first decade um, of 1900s. Um, so we went through sort of a photographic analysis um, of what the the documents that we had to understand what's changed through time. You know, how did this space start architecturally? Um, the earliest known photograph that we have on the bottom left, um, we believe to be taken around 1879. As you see, the room originally did not have a lot of this decorative paint scheme that we see today, but there were a few of the architectural features, such as the beams at the ceiling. Um, there was the wood wainscoting around the lower portion of the, the room, as well as um, the, the rostrum at the West End. Um, we also found the original drawings of the rostrum from 1879, which is on the far left. Um, and there were several architectural changes made through time, but most notably in the early 1900s, like I said, is when Brother Schroen was commissioned to implement the decorative paint scheme and a lot of the decorative millwork that we see throughout the room. Um, the earliest known photograph that we have of that scheme was circa 1901. Now, there were some other changes made over the years, such as changing the wood flooring. There's an inlay pattern in the wood flooring and some updates to the wood wainscoting around the room, as well as um, some changes um, several times through history of the light fixtures. Um, the early light fixtures that you first see in the 1870s were gaslit fixtures. And then as you notice in the 1901 photograph, they had changed to electrified light fixtures, the surface mounted fixtures on the ceiling. But what did remain constant throughout the history of the space was a lot of the decorative paint that Brother Schroen implemented. Um, I'll let Evergreen Architectural Studios discuss the details of his work in just a minute. They are definitely the experts on that architectural arts um, and the, the, the level of craftsmanship that went into that. 
Um, but as we went through several of these photographs, you can go to the next slide, through sort of the middle of the 20th century, a lot of these are photographs taken of presumably members of the philodemic society and alumni using the space, but in careful study of these, we start to pick up on some of the subtle changes made to either the rostrum or the valance and the draperies behind the rostrum. Again, I mentioned changes to the light fixtures. Those um, went through maybe about a half a dozen different iterations over time. And then if you go to the next slide, you'll notice that, um, well, actually, it was, uh, forgive me, it was back on the other slide. Um, on either side of the rostrum, the Philodemetians had accumulated quite a number of trophies. And in the 1970s, there were some trophy cases built on either side of the rostrum that are no longer seen today. Um, another notable change that happened in sort of the mid, mid 20th century were some changes to the overall paint scheme in the room. A lot of the decorative arts remained, but some of the color palette in the room has been modified a few times and is not as dark as it was originally. So I'll let Evergreen speak to some of the paint analysis that they've done to help us better understand exactly what that color palette was. And then on the last slide, I will conclude with a comparison. Um, we have some recent photographs taken on the right-hand side. Probably the most notable change is that there was an upper desk at the rostrum that has since been removed. Um, and we have a lot of detail imagery of the ceiling and what Max mentioned a moment ago of the commemoration of some of these speakers within the, the, the ceiling itself. So as we talk about the photographs in the room and the portraits on the wall and some of the names that are inscribed in the decorative paint on the ceiling, um, that bleeds into an understanding of, of that decorative arts throughout the space. Um, so through all of this research, We'll go to the next slide. Um, we have landed on a period of significance for the room itself, which is slightly different from the period of significance for Healy Hall. And we have determined that the contribution by Brother Schroen of this decorative arts scheme is important to consider as we reimagine the space. Um, and that period would date to the early 20th century, circa 1901, or through that first decade. And so I'll hand it over to Katie with Evergreen to speak more specifically to the details of the decorative arts scheme. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, I'd like to point out some of the major features. Um, Susan mentioned there's quite a few decorative features in this room um, and finishes that date to Brother Schoen's original decorative scheme around 1901. Um, starting in the lower portion of the wall, there is wooden wainscot um, that goes around the entire border of the room um, in the lower dado level. Um, this wooden design kind of continues upwards into the walls, um, creating wooden framing elements uh, around certain elements on the wall. So there uh, is wooden framing around the photographs and nameplates and um, creating wall panel frames for the larger portraits in the center of the wall. Um, a lot of this wood is carved um, in certain areas. It's inlaid with um, carved wooden rosettes. Um, and then there's a number of portable artworks. As I mentioned, we have, um, we have removable photographs um, that are portraits. Uh, below, below those photographs, there are um, engraved nameplates. And then uh, in the center, moving upwards in the center of the walls, there are uh, painted oil portraits. And then along the very top, um, there's painted trompe oil and um, painted nameplates that kind of add decorative features along the, the top area of the wall. Um, if we move to the next slide, um, along the, uh, the along the front wall, there's uh, quite a bit of decoration. Um, there's textured and painted plaster work here in various different elements. Um, there is raised plaster work, um, such as a scroll and button motif um, and floored leaves. Uh, this raised plaster work is known as pastilia. Um, there are gilded elements such as the um, wreath and seal design um, that are finished in this metallic 
this metallic surface and um, other flat metallic decoration uh, along the wall. Um, and then there uh, are other plaster features that are not only um, painted, but texturized as well. Um, so there's a, a detail there of, of a border um, along the front wall that is uh, painted and textured. And then uh, similarly on the side walls and other areas around the room, uh, the plaster work that surrounds things like the portraits and the nameplates and running within the wooden paneling, that's also textured. Um, and then finally moving upwards onto the ceiling, um, there's additional decorative work, um, that, which is both painted and um, we, have, we have similar texturized uh, plaster work on the ceiling as well. Um, and you can see when you catch it in certain light or at an angle, um, for example, in the fruit and floral motif, um, there is various different textures throughout to bring out the different elements that are painted. Um, and this really adds a, a sort of a, a depth to the artwork um, and is quite unique. Um, in addition to this plaster work, there's a further trompe l'oeil painting, adding architectural depth and um, painted names as well. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that um, this decoration not only exists within the room, but also relates uh, to Healy Hall at a larger level. Um, throughout Healy Hall, there's, there's similar motifs and texture plaster um, through the halls and in various different rooms that sort of ties, ties all together. Um, and then uh, just to note that uh, although the paint color scheme of the room itself has changed over the years, um, in some of the historic photographs, you can see that the background color, the fl flat wall fields um, appear to be a sort of darker color and they, uh, these wall fields lighten over the years. Um, so while the, the color scheme has changed in certain areas, uh, this decorative plaster work and the wooden paneling, those sort of elements have not changed. Uh, and I think just to conclude on what Katie was describing, um, it, it, uh, we are trying to move forward to understand both the development and history of the room, the uh, significant historic features and decoration, and then really help to define um, what are the things that are important to keep in the room that relate to the period of significance and where is there flexibility to be uh, creative moving forward about um, addressing uh, potential changes to the room. So these elevations actually help to define areas that are for consideration of potentially um, uh, creating new opportunity to uh, re-envision how um, uh, uh, creative moments within the room uh, moving forward for a, a new generation of the use of the room. Next slide. Uh, so just to put this all in the context, obviously, uh, as you understand the timeline, the Philodemetians did their work. We were hired and brought on to help carry forward their research, but also to understand the history of the room, um, mm -hmm. the importance of the room and its decorative features. Uh, and then um, we, we are obviously overseeing and managing this entire uh, process on behalf of the university. So we are bringing project management to the team to orchestrate this entire project that uh, began um, about two months ago and uh, will continue forward with the conclusion of, of design sometime um, at the end of spring of 2022. Uh, but obviously as a part of this, there are uh, focus groups and public forums that uh, and Dayton will go into a little bit more detail as to describing uh, the process that we have orchestrated to make sure that we are getting as much input as possible along the way. Thanks, Jim. So, um, you know, as a as a value driven practice, we have a long we've long recognized the importance of of community and stakeholder engagement. You know, we believe that um, that that it's vital to the success of a project to center the voices and perspectives of those who will be um, ultimately impacted and shaped by the spaces we design. So, to that end, you know, we've created a process to facilitate that engagement. Um, and make sure that the stakeholders are a key constituent of our, our, our visioning, you know, ideation and decision-making process uh, throughout. 
Um, so as Jim was, was mentioning, the stakeholder engagement for this project is organized around three, a, sort of a three-tiered structure um, that, that consists of project management, um, that's being coordinated amongst the president's office, the philodemic society, um, university facilities and the Smith group team. And then we have a Smith group, which is leading the focus groups um, that are designed to facilitate the conversations and dialogue uh, with the philodemic students, uh, faculty and staff, uh, alumni and the descendant community. Um, and last but not least, um, uh, public forums, you know, geared towards the university community like, like we're having today. Next slide. Um, and there, there are based five basic phases designed into the project. Uh, there's the process of planning, um, you know, developing project goals, schedule, the engagement process. It also includes the room documentation process and research, which we done, which we did early on. Um, second is the uh, conceptual approach. Um, you know, this is where we develop a deeper understanding. Um, and build a, a conceptual framework for design with input from stakeholders. Um, and it's, um, it's probably uh, uh, important to note that we're, we're nearing the end of this phase, um, you know, before we proceed into the conceptual design phase of the project. Um, and then there's the conceptual design phase, which, we're, which we're, we're, we're sort of, um, you know, uh, slowly getting into. And this will be the ideation process where we'll, we'll develop, begin to develop um, conceptual design ideas. Then of course, there's the refinement and documentation, um, which will be uh, uh, an iterative process of incorporating relevant feedback from stakeholders. Um, and we'll you know, sort of take that feedback and refine and, and uh, refinalize the concept. And then finally, the execution or, or implementation phase. Next slide. Um, so uh, as part of the engagement session, you could go to the next slide. Uh, we conducted two sessions of, of stakeholder engagement with three separate focus groups. Um, the first focus group was the uh, film editions. Uh, the second focus group was made up of faculty, uh, staff, and alumni. Um, and the third session was made up of faculty, staff, alumni, and the descendant community. Um, our engagement sessions uh, mostly consisted of a combination of, of in-person and virtual attendees. Uh, so we designed both um, an in-house version and, and virtual version of each exercise. Uh, we also utilized uh, a mural board, which is, um, for those who don't know, a, um, a virtual whiteboard um, that can be uh, um, accessed by way of uh, an, an internet browser. Um, so we used, um, we used that to facilitate and document the feedback from, from these sessions, both, both internally and, and externally. Next slide. Um, and the purpose and goal of the, of the first focus group was to, to really have a, a high level philosophical dis discussion to, to understand and, and glean you know, the, the unique values, um, sensibilities, perspectives, and ideas from each uh, uh, stakeholder group um, for reimagining the philodemic room. Um, so we started with a, a set of high level uh, probing questions. Um, for example, you know, what does a successful project achieve? Um, what does or should the, or who, who does or should the room belong to? You know, how public is it? Um, what ideals are in, embodied by the current philodemic society? And we gave each individual uh, time to answer these questions, um, you know, for five to 10 minutes. Then we would regroup as a, as a larger collective to have, uh, you know, conversations about, um, 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 about, these, about these questions and, and, and uh, meticulously documented it all, you know, through our mural board um, and, and in-house um, um, visioning. Next. Yeah, so um, we wanted to continue to engage participants in the philosophical thought around the room by presenting a range of seven questions or ideas. Um, and these were associated with a scale that had two extremes on either end and a, a representation of that is on the right, upper right corner. Um, and we gave the participants a, a chance to gauge both sides of the spectrum and with understanding the question and idea presented, then place a dot that represents their opinion. Um, with that, this exercise was really made to reveal the temperature of consensus and divergence within the groups. Um, and on how to, you know, reinterpret the room. And the questions kind of range. So 
for the example, we have memorializing individuals. Um, on the left, we have, you know, uh, portraits selected based on a new criteria. And on the right, we have um, basically something other than individuals and portraits. Um, going down to storytelling and teaching, we have uh, an active and interactive space content that's didactive versus a passive environment. Uh, so it's really trying to gauge this range on, on, this, on this spectrum and, and seeing where um, uh, individuals lie in the continuum. And then once that was solidified, we then um, had an in-depth discussion on this um, with having uh, participants uh, kind of talk about like, their options and why they decided to place their dots on the specific area of the scale. Um, with that, also, we did document this on the mural board for anyone who is um, hybrid to then follow along and have their, you know, their opinions also incorporated within, within the process. And as we close out the first engagement session, um, we, we had some conclusion questions. Um, these were really to gauge final perspectives, but also kind of go beyond the room and essence of the process, but also the room itself and what this project legacy could be. So the first question was, what can we gain from telling the story of the, this room in this process? And then what is the legacy of this project? Um, as well as, you know, thoroughly documenting and then having kind of this debrief discussion afterwards. Thanks, Camille. And then the, the second round of stakeholder engagements were structured very similar to the first. You know, we hosted uh, three sessions again of stakeholder engagement with the, the with the, the same three focus groups to continue our dialogue and discussions. And again, these discussions were all were all hybrid, meaning that there was a combination of, of in person and virtual attendees. Uh, so we continue to utilize the mural board to facilitate engagement virtually, as well as using it as a, as a medium to collect uh, data. Um, yeah, next, next slide. Right, so even before diving into our second round of exercises, we wanted to touch base on an analysis review of the first engagement session. Um, so as you can see in this kind of word diagram, below it, it it's, it's basically capturing the overarching represented topics amongst the, the different focus groups. So it's the range of shared discussion topics and common themes um, with the larger you know, words uh, being more amplified in the conversations that were had. So understanding um, Georgetown as a whole, the, the philodemic society and how eloquence in the defense of liberty ties within the space um, a strong discussion on history and how that's represented within the space and, and how we enhance this overall arching idea of community. As well, um, we did a summarized analysis on the scale exercise. As you can see here, this is a collapsed version of kind of all the input we received. So the blue represents the first focus group of the Philodemetians. The red is the faculty, staff, and alumni group two, and then the green is faculty, staff, alumni, and members of the descendants community for group three. Um, and the results revealed a wide range of values and sensibilities. And through this range, we were able to identify the general consensus of each scale um, within a range. Um, and we learned from this is that uh, that majority were aiming towards or it's leaning towards a more didactic outcome for the room. But for the second engagement session, we needed to dive deeper into understanding what that means. So the, the second session of in, in engagement exercises really um, was focused to reconcile and mitigate the divergence of views that were revealed um, as you can see inside the scale exercise. Thanks, Camille. Yeah, so to, as, as Camille mentioned, to really hone in um, and, and really kind of um, determine whether or not this space should be uh, more, more, more geared towards memorialization or uh, you know, sort of didactic, um, we designed a series of dot exercises where we uh, presented the stakeholders with a, uh, you know, different categories of options and allowed them to sort of uh, democratically uh, place a quota of dots 
on what they liked and what they didn't like. So uh, the, the red dots uh, were placed on items they didn't like. Uh, yellow dots were placed on items that were, they were neutral towards and green dots were placed on things that they, they loved. Um, and the first exercise, you know, started with the question, you know, what is the uh, interpretive content of the room? And we presented the stakeholders with a, with a range of categories. We had uh, symbols, um, uh, you know, Georgetown logo, the Philomedician logo, um, ideas, which, which, you know, we, we had debates, uh, you, know, you know, unpackaging the idea of, of the ideas behind justice, democracy, liberty, um, inclusion, you know, some, some of the themes that we heard in the first round of discussions. Um, stories, you know, um, you know, we talked about the idea of the 20, 27, the 272 enslaved uh, humans that were sold by the Jesuits, you know, possibly the Patrick Healy story, um, focusing on a famous debate, um, um, uh, an indigenous land story. Um, we talked about values, you know, again, the, the Georgetown University motto or the, you know, the Philodemic Society motto, eloquence in defense of liberty, um, uh, Jesuit values, or, or the idea of, of uh, you know, simply uh, leaving the room bare or doing, doing nothing, keeping it minimal, um, you know, with the baseline of removing the seven portraits um, uh, or removing all the portraits um, in, in the room. Um, and then also giving, leaving space for the, the uh, stakeholders to also uh, give us feedback on any other uh, categories or interpretive potential uh, interpretive content that may have been missed um, um, in the discussion. And then the second exercise was framed around the question of what is the range of, of technological integration or, or the medium of, of content? Um, and so we presented several uh, categorical options for that. You know, um, the idea of commissioned artwork, which could be, you know, murals or decorative arts or uh, uh, portable paintings, uh, could be paintings of an individual or a moment in history. Um, the idea of, of maybe photography um, being in the space could be could be new photography. It could be photography that we um, uh, retrieve from the archives. Um, uh, the, the idea of, of showcasing artifacts um, on the wall or, or, or within the space. So, you know, we talked about the need to kind of showcase the trophies, you know, the philodemic trophies, you know, it could be books or, or documents um, that are of, of value um, to the philodemic society or Georgetown. We talked about even the, the gavel, you know, taking on some, some, some significance in the room and, and, and being um, 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 interpreted um, or other symbols. We talked about historic timelines, um, uh, interactive displays, both digital um, and analog. Uh, we talked about the idea of maybe even utilizing QR codes, um, you know, due to uh, the limitation of space. Um, uh, the idea of featuring quotes or, or um, and uh, infographics uh, was the last was the last component. And then and then lastly, uh, we did it, and we also did an exercise to sort of explore um, the three basic options for making the um, the 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 room or really the rostrum uh, more accessible. Um, and we presented uh, we presented an option um, where we sort of essentially got rid of all the steps or tiers that um, um, sort of elevate uh, the rostrum, um, so that the rostrum was sort of flush um, with the, with the room as a whole or the idea of integrating a ramp into the rostrum or integrating a lift. And, and so got feedback on that. And if you go, you could go to the next one, the next slide. And then, you know, we, we allow, we'd allow the stakeholders to essentially get up out of their seats if they were participating in person and to, to literally peruse the room um, and place the dots, you know, the, the yellow, uh, the yellow, red and green dots accordingly. Um, and then, um, you know, we gave them about 10 minutes to do that. And then we regrouped collectively and had some, um, some really great discussions about the decisions that, that were made. Um, and, um, and we're able to kind of track all of this through the, mu through the mural board and have, those, have, the, have an inclusive discussion that involved the folks who were in the room and the folks who were, were participating um, remotely. And then do you want to speak to the drawing exercise, Camille? Yes. So um, that initial exercise was a great jumping off point um, into getting into this drawing exercise where we gave um, everyone in the focus groups and participants kind of an ability to have creative license 
after you know the insight we've gotten from our discussions prior and also just from the previous exercise and also understanding kind of the, the history of significance in the room and in the areas of opportunity. So we presented the participants with uh, a floor plan, reflected ceiling plan, north, east, south, and west elevation to where they could take creative license within the room with uh, pens and sticky notes and, and with using the mural board could do exactly the same thing by pulling in stickies and, and pulling in imagery to start to you know define these, these basically blank zones that we've designated throughout our discussions. And then we were able to, you know, have a, a collective conversation about decision making on um, what was put on the west elevation versus the north, and kind of really trying to decide in that space um, what where is the eye catching, and and also started bringing up functionality too um, about when debates do occur, what where's the what's the wall significance, and um, where's the where's the space for a, a lot of opportunity if, if it was going to be. Um, almost a mural base or photography or interactive displays. I think uh, definitely the, the exercise prior truly informed um, the reactions we received um, from the drawing exercise. And then this is just, these are a few imagery uh, of the exercise actually in live time and in terms of um, uh, the participants actually drawing on the plans and the elevations. And then as you can see on the screen in the middle picture, it's also the interactive display of, you know, the mural board being used in real time. Yeah, and, and again, uh, just to chime in a little bit, this this exercise was also done both both in house and virtually. So the yes. the participants who were were, were um, participating remotely were able to kind of do this creative exercise. Um, um, you know, uh, through the mural board, and um, you know, the, the the goal is to kind of um, it's not not so much um, the emphasis on 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 the drawings per se, but really um, the discussions that we had afterwards. Um, we we're able to kind of um, uh, use these use this exercise to really kind of force the the the, the uh, stakeholders to really you know really think you know tangibly about about you know how the space could be reimagined and so as you can imagine the the, the discussions that that were gleaned from this were, were really fruitful and helpful um, to, to really help us understand uh, what what was of value um, to each of the individual uh, groups and, and um, participants. Uh, thanks, Dayton and Camille. Um, so I, I just wanted to make sure we circle back to where we are in the process and, and our next steps. So um, as I think we shared um, collectively, and we did uh, a good chunk of research and, and um, sort of moved that research forward into understanding the history of the room, the history of the features of the room, and, and making sure we understood uh, Brother Schoen's intent and the uh, decorative features of the room and what what uh, importance there is to the period of significance and how they contribute to that space. And then also, where are there opportunities for us to be creative in, in uh, moving forward uh, in rethinking uh, the room? The one thing that I think maybe we didn't mention at the beginning of the pro uh, the, this process is that um, in addition to sort of the rethinking of the decorative features, there are many users to this room. So we are also, as part of this process, thinking about integrating new technology into the room to make it a better meeting room, uh, thinking about uh, new furnishings so that the room is more flexible. The Phil Demetians uh, have this room for their use, but it's also used, I think, as Carolyn mentioned in the beginning, uh, for various meetings for the, to support the university and the president. So part of the task that we've been asked to do as the design consultant is also to uh, rethink um, you know, uh, sort of uh, sound augmentation in the room, new lighting in the room, uh, flexible furnishings that can be easily moved to set up for the various users of the room. So all of that's gonna be sort of taken into consideration as we move forward from the input we've gotten from these various stakeholder groups and as we start to put things to um, paper as to ideas and concepts for uh, the next steps in this process. Thank you, Jim, and um, thank you to everyone for your, your remarks and presentations today.
we do have time to take um, a couple of questions for discussion. And I wanna start with a question connecting back to um, earlier elements of, of the briefing today, um, talking about the historical elements um, in the room. And the question being, can you speak to ways that a room can both be reimagined and redesigned and also retain its historical character? It's obviously present in there. How can a project balance and try to achieve both of those things? Maybe Jim, would you like to, to start and, and Dayton as well? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I, I think that's partly uh, the question. Uh, the answer to the question is partly what we were trying to define in the beginning of the presentation. We, we wanted to make sure we were rooted in good understanding of the history of the room and how the room fits into the bigger context of the building and understanding of how Brother Schroen brought his decorative features to the room. And uh, as we showed in the timeline, you know, the room didn't always look like that. It looked like something else before he came and implemented his decorative scheme within the room. So it's uh, trying to understand that intent and then also trying to understand the changes over time to establish that period of significance, which we defined early on. And then sort of highlighting those areas within the room that um, where there is flexibility to introduce something new. And when I say something new, you know, I, I think we've had this discussion internally as a team and Dayton, you can weigh in on this, but I, I think it's always within the context of understanding the history of the room. So I, I don't think anyone thought we were gonna, uh, or we certainly didn't think we were gonna come in and whitewash the whole room and start over. There's always been the intent to respect portions of the room, understand the history of the room, but also introduce new things that are sympathetic to what's already there. Yeah, I echo that. I mean, that the, the whole, the whole rationale behind doing the historical analysis was to really kind of establish and understand what what was sacred and essential um, to the space um, um, and you know and then the the stakeholder engagement you know is really is really important here because through the stakeholder engagement we're we're able to kind of glean and, and take from that an understanding of what lasting values and, and principles and, and ideas are, are, are really important for ensuring that um, this space has lasting value, um, you know, and that will it will resonate with the, you know, the, the, the you know, the all the, the range of, 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 of stakeholders and users that are going to really kind of occupy this space and be empowered by it and be um, impacted by it well into the future. So, um, um, so so much of what we much of what we designed in our in our engagement process was to really kind of tease that out and really understand what the what those sort of driving you know, sort of ideological principles are to really build a, a a a framework for the design that that will resonate deep into the future. Thank you. And and building building off that actually. Um, in design, and especially when redesigning, reimagining an, his, an historic space, um, how can we ensure that historical memory isn't lost? Um, how do we um, take steps to make sure we aren't erasing, erasing history, but rather acknowledging it and keeping it as part of truth telling? Uh, well, I'll start, and I think Dave, you'll probably want to weigh in on this as well, but I. I... I think uh, part of it is that we have discussed uh, uh, and we have been tasked as, as part of this project to make sure that we are interpreting the history of the room as part of the project. So uh, whatever changes are made, whatever decisions are made, there we, we have been thorough about our documentation of the room. I think we mentioned earlier, we digitally scanned the room so that we have a very accurate snapshot of what exists today. We've done a lot of the archival research of what preceded that and how the room changed. Uh, and we've had some professional photographs taken of the room as well um, with the intent that whatever decisions are made about how to change the room, we can, in the end, in its, in its sort of new appearance, have some interpretation, interpretive component that also tells the journey of why did it change, how did it change, and what was the history of what it was before versus what it looks like today. Yeah, just to, just to tag in on that, I mean, I think honesty is, is the key word here. Um, and, you know, truth telling, you know, truth telling is, is, a, as, as a, is a mechanism um, that can be used to, to, you know, hold us accountable, um, but also challenge us to, to be better and, and do better. Um, and so I think um, to the degree that we can sort of 
retain um, um, the sort of uh, historical uh, uh, narratives within the room, but figure out creative ways to, to, to build on those narratives um, and, and keep enough substance there where we can really be honest about ourselves and, and, and challenge ourselves uh, to do better, uh, I think would be a, 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 wonderful, a wonderful way of, of moving this forward um, in a win-win in a, in a -win situation. Great. Our next question is, you know, given the historic nature of the room and of the building, the building being much older, um, does that present particular design or even logistical challenges when approaching a project like this, the age of the building in the room? Uh, well, uh, obviously, as I think we mentioned before, um, first and foremost, you know, Brother Schoen and his decorative painting was not just contained within this room, right? So it carried out into the building at large. Uh, so I think that was part of why we felt it was important to understand the period of significance of the building, the decorative uh, intent of Brother Schroen, and then also how it got carried out within the, uh, the Phil Demick Society room itself. Um, but I also think that obviously with any old building, I mean, this building was built in 1879 and um, the room was finished out subsequent to that, you need to be considerate of when you uh, introduce new technology, new new systems, right? I mean, part of the task, as I mentioned earlier, is this, this room needs to be updated to be a functional meeting room, as well as a graceful uh, and welcoming place for the Philodemetians to uh, uh, have and host their debates. So uh, all of that has to be done with a, a careful eye and, and, um, and a care to make sure that we're respecting the, uh, the building fabric, but, you know, uh, old buildings always have surprises. Um, and, um, and I think we even encountered a surprise. You may not have noticed it. I don't think Susan called it out in her timeline and history of the room, but behind the rostrum of the um, Phil, uh, Phil Society room, uh, there's a backdrop that had some drapery, et cetera. Behind that is actually a window that's been covered over. So if you actually are on the outside of the building and look back up, you can see that window. So again, just understanding the uh, history of the and age of the building as we move forward and introduce new things um, and and, you know, we just have to be creative and respectful as designers to integrate that new, those new systems and technologies into the room that complement the room and make sure it's set up for success moving forward. Thanks. And then maybe um, as a final question, I know this is this is a hard one, but very interesting. Um, from a design and artistic perspective, how do you begin to go from broad and high level concepts like values or a motto, elo eloquence and the defense of liberty and start to translate that into visuals that would become part of an interpretive design scheme? I mean, design is a, you know, design is a, is a powerful tool. Um, and, you know, the way that, the way that you have impact is to, is to, um, really, really, you know, move people emotionally. And I, and I think in a lot of ways, um, you, you know, this, this process, at least for me, um, you know, always begs, you know, what is the, what do you, what do you, what is the emotional takeaway here? What, what is a, what is a win for this project? How do you want people to feel um, when they enter this space? And from that, um, we're able to begin to ask a series of, of questions, right? That begin to kind of tease out you know, a, a, a path of, of how to arrive at those emotions, you know, uh, fundamentally. Um, so if, if, if we're, if we are striving for, um, uh, for people to feel a sense of acknowledgement, you know, we, we will design a, a, a sense, a sense of questions or structure of questions that help us to get there. And through those questions, uh, those questions then lead us to to sort of explore um, design opportunities or avenues or ways of, of approaching and 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 fundamentally uh, uh, getting us to that 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 core idea of 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 uh, uh, moving people emotionally. And so I, I think I think um, based on all the the distillation of of, of data and feedback that we got from all these. Um, 
these engagement meetings, we can we can definitely distill from that. You, you mean you saw the word you saw the word salad, right? Um, the word collage, and and you you saw some of the 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 ideas that were were embedded in there. And so we'll essentially take all that and begin to kind of basically structure um, a, a framework, um, a design framework to 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 sort of um, harken back to those those core ideas and sentiments that that came out of the engagement sessions. Yeah, and, and I also think, uh, Katie, you might want to just uh, also weigh in on this because in, in the end, for I think what Dayton was talking about, sort of funneling down into taking big ideas and actually touching on implementation, in many ways, you're you're part of the team because you have a respect for the understanding of the decorative features, but your team also has the ability to translate abstract ideas to something on the walls. Sure, um, and that's that's exactly right. Um, I think that, you know, all the, the information that's kind of being gleaned and distilled from the various focus groups um, and, uh, um, and, you know, public outreach, um, all these discussions will all be synthesized down and, um, you know, we'll, we'll focus in on, on certain specific ideas. And then um, this is exactly what you know, Evergreen as a firm does, we're able to, to take concepts and ideas. Um, and we have a very talented team of artisans and designers that can um, take concepts and translate them into visual artwork um, and something that's more, you know, tangible, less abstract. Um, and, you know, another aspect that our firm is able to do um, is the conservation of different elements of the room that we that do want to be saved and restored and and kept as part of the um, the the history moving forward into the future. Um, so it's it's really up to to the artisans who are much more talented than I, but um, but they are able to do this kind of work, and we we do it all the time in um, a wide range of uh, buildings, churches, all sorts of historic buildings, um, and are able to integrate new new artwork and concepts into the historic fabric. And I, I would add to that, that, you know, it's, it's, it is a, it's a very subjective process. And, and that's why we um, have really created this structure um, where we, um, where we incorporate and center the stakeholders in, in the process and bring them along the journey. Um, so that um, as we, as we develop concepts, um, um, you know, we, we present those concepts and it's, it's an iterative, iterative process where we, we go back and forth and they help, they help to, to court, sort of answer those questions and, and, and hone us in on, on solutions that make sense, you know, for, for them um, as, as power users. So um, it's, there's, no, there's no formula, there's no formula other than other than really engaging with the the, the folks who who um, are really going to be impacted by the space and 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 ensuring that that we're hitting the mark, and that that's just that's that takes experimentation and 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 really kind of exploring different ideas and and laying them out and 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 creating a process to to get feedback. Thank you. Um... Our session time today is wrapping up. Um, so before we conclude, I want to thank again all of our presenters, um, all of our attendees who, tu who tuned in today. Um, thank you for joining. Um, thank you for your comments and questions as part of the Q&A. I know we've had outreach from alumni um, during today's session, and um, we'll be following up with alumni who have been reaching out and providing opportunities to engage as the project continues. In the meantime, we want to invite everyone to, con to consider taking the post-event survey that we'll be distributing. Everyone who RSVP'd for today's um, session will receive the link in an email, and we'll also make that available to um, colleagues who are um, going to view the webinar later as a recording. With that, thank you guys again. Um, thank you to our presenters, the Philodemic Society, um, Smith Group, and Evergreen and we will um, conclude today's presentation. Thank you.